Hello, everyone, and welcome to the third episode of Blabbing Translators. My name is Dmitry Kornyhov. I'm your host. Helping me tonight, my amazing co-host, Yelena Tereshenkova. Uh, Blabbing Translators is the first live talk show about translation and translators, where Yelena and I interview very interesting people of our industry. And tonight, we have a very exciting guest. Uh, her name is Sheila Gomez, and she's an English-Brazilian-Portuguese translator. Uh, she has over 20 years of experience, and she specializes in game localization. She's, al she's also involved in uh, building uh, uh, local communities and creating an environment for uh, developers and uh, video game localization specialists where we can, we can meet and discuss common industry problems. So, uh, Sheila, over to you. Please uh, introduce yourself and tell a few things about yourself. All right. Thank you, Dimitri. And thank you, Elena, too, for the opportunity to be here and talk to my peers. And oh, I pleasure. Hope you're... <laughs> oh my! And uh, I, uh, I am, as Dimitri said, a translator for a little over twenty years, and I have been involved with game localization for like four years or so, uh, most mostly exclusively uh, game localization. And uh, I work with IGDA, the localization group. Uh, inside IGDA, which is a group that promotes communication between developers and localizers and try to establish best practices uh, for everyone who wants both trying to get their game across the world and the people that localize to have standards to follow and get a more professional market. And uh, as Dimitri said too, I'm very involved with uh, organizing local communities uh, regarding meetups uh, or anything that gets translators, both beginners and veterans together, and uh, people that are in the like curious about it, or other professionals that can also aggregate some kind of value to our uh, work and. We have been doing some very interesting things here in Curitiba, where I live in the south of Brazil. It's very interesting. Uh, how did you uh, start working in video game localization? What was your first experience? Mm -hmm. So I've always uh, been interested in games since I was a kid. And I had all systems, especially the Nintendo line. And at the time, I had uh, you were a Nintendo boy too good. Uh, I, have a, I had a store that was, uh, we sold video games and consoles and uh, so I, I got to know mostly all kinds of consoles since they entered the market. And uh, so it was already an interest when I started translating as a full-time freelancer. And I tried to know more about the market. It and uh, I started in Pros actually, the Pros platform, um, mm -hmm. getting to know agencies and trying to uh, get jobs. Started very low, of course, as usually people that start in Pros do. And then I went got to know more about the market and get to know people that were already uh, working in it. Uh, I started also knowing better agencies and uh, so I actually got to the point that I could support my house by myself and mm -hmm. and uh, it's very uh, it's a very interesting area to work in from the sense that you work with something you love games and all but at the same time it's very challenging you know that because you are also a game localizer and we have to sometimes go against our own beliefs in what we should do when translating and uh, it involves a lot of uh, communication uh, between clients and professionals we usually work in teams and so this is something that can be challenging as well that's why i think working with communities for example is also something that is almost natural when we want and like to work in teams and it helps everyone uh, what do you think what, what do you think are the biggest challenges uh, that video game localizers face today lack of context <laughs> well <laughs> usually when i when i started i got a lot of 
Excel tables with no pictures, and I never played the game. Uh, actually, there was even one time that I, I received the Excel tables and I did all the finished the translation uh, delivered. And uh, in the same email where I delivered the translation, the agency gave me the Steam code so I could now play the game I had translated, mm -hmm. which was so cool. No, <laughs> because I, I could have played before and I know I could have translated it much better, but, uh, and so what I, what I see is the biggest problem is this lack of context and uh, of information, references, and uh, having agencies is something important because at the time the games need to be translated into many languages. And so I understand their role, but uh, they, it's also uh, a hindrance sometimes because they, they are one more step in the middle of all the process that already involves a lot of people. And so communication can be hard because you send yes. questions, they don't answer because they send to the developer that is already doing something else and also don't answer. And uh, so you mostly end up doing everything by yourself and guessing a lot sometimes. And uh, it's not very comfortable working like that, but we develop our techniques to deal with uh, the thing. Do you mostly? Do you mostly work uh, with uh, direct clients or agencies? Because I don't have uh, very much experience with game localization. I did some localization of promotional materials, but not the games it's themselves. But mm -hmm. I think it's one area of uh, specialization where the constant contact with client is crucial. And it's rare, too, because mm -hmm. I, I don't know uh, personally, people that work with direct clients, except for those that are working in studios or like offices from studios, and they are very rare. Uh, mm -hmm. Most people work with agencies exactly because of, of what I, I had mentioned before about uh, mm -hmm. the need of uh, many different languages. Languages, yeah. Into, yeah, in the game be translated into. And so it's a, a necessary evil sometimes, to lack of a better word. <laughs> But uh, when you get a good agency, and I work with some good agencies that I, it took me some time to find, of course, uh, mm -hmm. the process can be very smooth and some things can go very well and uh, everybody together can collaborate and get to a better result, exactly because there are many experienced people working together. But most of the time we have to deal with all the problems people have with agencies in general, even in other areas of work. Uh, in translation work. Yeah, yeah that's interesting. Uh, it, it happens quite often when you work with agencies, it's a lack of communication because you have to uh, ask questions and you gotta have to, uh, you gotta have a direct contact with the developer. Yeah. And it's some, sometimes it's not possible because uh, some agencies don't prefer to uh, create an environment where translators can collaborate mm -hmm. with uh, developers directly. Some agencies do, and uh, actually, I work with a couple of agencies where uh, we have a, a shared environment. It can be a piece of software or an online platform where translators can ask questions directly to the developers, and developers get notifications, and they we can communicate without the need of uh, back and forth between project. That's managers. wonderful. Do you think this is something that uh, should be a standard in the localization industry? No doubt about that. And uh, in IGDA, we have this, uh, all, all the things that we can do in terms of trying to be in contact with developers, uh, we work towards that because this is so uh, important. Even before the translation gets to us, even when the, the project of the game is still in the beginning, uh, they should be thinking about uh, how to make it to be localized. And mm -hmm. not everybody thinks about that, of course, because they even don't know about the area enough as to think about that beforehand. That's why uh, it's so important for us to be in touch not only with localizers that are trying to enter the industry, but also developers, even in universities or schools that are thinking about uh, working with games because this is a way that we can get to them before they start and already start one uh, step ahead. Yeah. And uh, I try to 
get every opportunity I, I, I envision to be in giving talks or inviting right. students to participate in the meetings we have with our group here in Piriti, but we're in other cities to try to be in uh, conferences, even conferences that are not uh, translation related, like I've been to uh, conference, video game conferences that we have here in Brazil and campus party places where the developers are and uh, to try to establish a dialogue, which is so important, essential really for localization to go, to go without, well, at least less problems because many people are involved and it, it's hard to say that it won't, there won't be problems at all, but uh, we try our best, yeah. yeah. What kind of challenges do you face when you're trying to establish a dialogue between uh, developers and the translation community? Uh, language, especially because we speak our language. Uh, sometimes they speak their the same language, but they speak computer language. We speak translation language. <laughs> it's it's yeah, really hard uh, to to get across what we mean because they see things in other directions that we we have no idea sometimes where they are going. And uh, there was a very interesting article the other day talking uh, from an, a writer, a game writer, and that she said that many times the games were made before the story and she had to, to get the game and write a story for something that was already uh, going on, something that was ready in the mind of someone else. And I, I can only imagine the kinds of difficulties this person had because we had uh, very similar ones. Yeah. We have to work in the, the heads of programmers sometimes, and if we don't understand coding, for example, it can be mm -hmm. very hard to go through uh, the work and really make sense out of it. Mm. Yes. Uh, do you think it's essential for a video game localization specialists to have uh, some kind of a at least basic understanding of programming and how uh, game development works in general? Yes, I do. And uh, that's why I, I got involved with uh, the developers' events and I try to read a lot about the other side, as I say, uh, to be in touch with how they think. And mm -hmm. so it, it works. Uh, it, it's a good way to get like a, a base to work on. And uh, many times we get files, we get translations that are programming files that are based on code, pure code. And even if we have mm -hmm. cat tools that will extract it and we, we get the, the code only in, in tags, it helps to understand what's behind it. And so you get a better sense because you usually don't have context. And so the context, the little context you get is sometimes within the code. So it, it does help. Um, how can we facilitate uh, uh the process that we can get more context from developers. How can we encourage them to I don't know, share screenshots or provide Steam codes? Because not every developer is uh, ready, I think, to provide Steam codes to a third party, especially when the game is still in development. Yeah. Uh, there might be a lot of uh, issues involved, like confidentiality, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. How can we, uh, I don't know, create a build a better trust between developers and localizers? Mm -hmm. it, 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 it usually takes time. It's not like when we start working with the agencies that we get this kind of trust, so they will send us whatever they get. Sometimes they don't even get it uh, before some time. They uh, have communication issues too with the studios because the, the creation of a game is something that is not like very linear. Many people are working at the same time, and so they will send parts of the text, they will send parts of the pictures or not and uh, they have to work with whatever they get and they are uh, always very stranded by the, the time uh, the deadlines that are very uh, short because of this mm -hmm. problem of developers not thinking about localization from the very beginning and so we get like two days to do the whole localization of a game that was made in small i'm kidding but uh, it's something around that yeah. <laughs> and uh, so what we can do, what I usually do, is try to be 
uh, informed about games in general. So I'm always in blogs, in game platforms, where I can know about the games that are, that are being made or similar games to the ones I usually translate. And uh, also the, the sites, the fan sites, where people discuss about the games. YouTube, when they launch the, the game, usually there are some teasers. Anything that can help me understand uh, what the game is about, uh, the general scenario, the time, the register, and anything that can give me a picture, at least a little picture of it. Uh, can you recommend some uh, websites or sources for translators where we can uh, uh, meet the developers and uh, uh, hang out in this uh, kind of the same, the, 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 yeah, the development crowd? <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, one place where we can talk directly to developers is Stack Exchange. They even have like a Quora similar uh, environment <laughs> where people can post questions. And so they post sometimes questions about localization and we can be there and answer them, which is a start. But it's mostly uh, for translators in general, what we usually do here in Brazil, at least what my colleagues do, is to be in all Facebook groups they can, because Facebook is usually the, the place where people meet, even if informally, but that's where you get the contacts and you can be with people. And it's through Facebook, for example, that I, I knew a lot of people from the local IGDA chapters, and uh, we've formed groups as well. And uh, sometimes events like the Glow Game Jam that I was part in the last two years, we gave workshops and talked to the people who were developing games there. And so opportunities sometimes can be in where you less less expect and talk to people and try to be in touch with uh, the developers and people that are related to this industry. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a wonderful advice because, uh, uh, you know, sometimes uh, it's all about communication and it's all about bringing together the experts and uh, finding a, you know, a common ground. And uh, we are interested in, in, in video games and they are interested in video games. Yes, we speak different languages, but it, it doesn't mean that we cannot have conversations. And there are plenty of places, like you said, Facebook groups, uh, conferences, uh, events for developers or LinkedIn mm -hmm. groups. There are many, many different places where people can just uh, yeah. uh, meet on, on the eye level, so to speak. Exactly. I think it's very, good, it's a very good advice because this is how we can uh, create an environment where we can have a streamlined conversation without any third parties interrupting and probably educate developers and uh, mm -hmm. catch them in the beginning of the development phase so they could start, start thinking about uh, video, uh, video game localization in advance because that's mm -hmm. a very important issue, especially in, uh, in our industry. Uh, what kind of advice can you give to people who are just starting out but very interested in video game localization? People that are, that are I'm sorry, I didn't get the beginning of your question. How, what, kind of, what, what kind of advice can you give to people who are in the beginning of their journey and they're just starting out in a video game localization? All right. Well, uh, trying to be in groups, uh, Facebook groups, or any, and also groups that you participate in person. If there aren't any in your city, you could start one. And this mm -hmm. is something I will talk uh, further on about <laughs> how to start a group like any kind of group, but uh, talking about video games, for example, you could be in Global Game Jam. Uh, a lot of cities here in Brazil, at least, a lot of cities hold events uh, in January where the people that are interested in making video games are. And it also brings people interested in localization as well. We had these people there and uh, when we uh, made the events and the workshops, uh, a lot of questions, a lot of interest. And uh, to enter the market is not very easy. You, you need to understand it first. And so mm -hmm. that's why it's good to be involved with the people that make games, because they uh, already understand a little bit more than we do. They are making it. And so maybe they can have comments that bring you uh, along. When I was in Global Game Jam, for example, 
there were people there who were promoting the games they made, people who were already experienced, and they were a bridge. They could be, uh, there were like four or five people that uh, really asked me uh, what was, uh, how the localization process was, what they could do for them, and uh, we started uh, talking. Uh, it didn't develop to a professional relationship at the time, but I believe that this is the kind of thing that you build little by little. And so any contact that you make, you never know what will come of it. What will come of it. Yeah. And uh, read a lot. Uh, read what other people are writing, like in the OpenMIC platform there. Uh, just today I read an article from one of uh, my colleagues from the steering committee of IGDA, Anthony Teixeira. About localizing, yep. I, I just I just read it. I made it our post of the day. <laughs> yeah, exactly, and I, I was very happy to see it. And so this information is is there if you look a little bit. The IGDA has a Facebook group where we post a lot of information, and even uh, jobs appear there sometimes. But one of the biggest uh, opportunities, I believe, is the lock jam the contest that mm -hmm. we hold in the LOCSIC, the Special Interest Group Organization on IDA. And it's uh, uh, an online contest that happens worldwide because it's on the internet. Anybody can be a part of it, being an amateur or a professional. And uh, the, it's a, a contest that it happens in this year will be in 13 days. So you have uh, quite a lot of time considering to translate a game and then mm -hmm. you submit it and it will be uh, judged by people who work in agencies, so people who are in the daily business of uh, evaluating games and translating them for professional studios. I have two friends that participated in the last year and they were uh, they received mentions from these agencies and they got jobs because of the, okay. the work we did and so it's something that uh, it can be fun the idea is to be something fun that you do and you get to know the localization world a little better uh, meet people the contacts you make are precious always in any situation and uh, you can even land a job, you never know. And so it, it can be an exp also a, uh, something as an experience to be added to your resume. And I really recommend that at least you get to know LogJam and see what it's about and uh, try to participate if you have the opportunity. Yeah, we have I a couple. Yeah, go, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to say that we have a couple of questions from our uh, listeners and viewers, uh, mm. I think we can take them, yeah? So yes. the first yeah. one is from Lewis, and he's asking, how do you communicate with your teams when localizing games? Do you do it via Skype or do you use something else? Uh, I, I usually use Skype. Uh, sometimes we work in platforms. Uh, for example, I work in MemoQ server or uh, other local, uh, sorry, other online translating platforms uh, like SmartLink or XTM or something like that. And then we have uh, like some kind of messenger in the platform, but mostly Skype, yeah, or email. Because uh, it's always with the niche apps, some kind of means of communication where you get things registered and you can refer to them later if necessary. Don't you use Trello for this uh, for this purpose? I think it's it's it might be a good tool as well because you do have Trello things registered a, there. Yeah, Trello is a great tool, but I use it for other things. For mm -hmm. to the date, I haven't used it. But uh, mm. maybe it's a good opportunity to start thinking about it. <laughs> yeah, I'm a big I'm a big fan of Trello. Yeah, me too. Don't use it for, 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 many, for many things, but we actually use it for blabbing translators as well to yes. coordinate things. <laughs> yeah. And I also I also use it for the open mic where I can just yeah. share my uh, my ideas. Community can also share their ideas and can also yeah. track the progress of uh, development of. Our group uses it to coordinate the activities we are 
organizing too. But maybe that's why, because I use it more for the planning in a longer time, let's say. And uh, when we want to just, you know, solve doubts or anything, because the deadlines are so uh, uh, tight. Start, yeah, tight. Uh, we get to speak very quickly, and so it's just a, a hadn't thought of it in a, in this sense. I think of Trello for something longer. Mm -hmm. time, let's say. <laughs> <laughs> I just love the, our next question. Um, mm -hmm. So it's mm. this one. What do you think about voluntary localization for non-free games? What's your suggestion to convince a developer that it's only fair to have a paid localization for a non-free game? <laughs> this is a very interesting question. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Great question, Julia. Yeah. Uh, and that's a hard one because uh, you see, the, the one reason that people want to translate games voluntarily is because they want to get their friends to play it too. So they want to be the, they want to see the game uh, more popular than it is, and they want to get people together around it. So the intention is good, and sometimes there are even uh, translators that have a little experience that do this kind of voluntary localization, uh, trying to get the experience and. It and use this as a part of their resume. Uh, I have friends who have done that. But the thing is, uh, the, for the developer, because they don't understand what localization is about, they think it's just something maybe innocent that they can get lucky enough to get people that understand language very well and mm -hmm. translate it well. But that's not how it usually works because we know that as professionals that localization is, and translation is not only transposing words from one language mm -hmm. to the other. And games have the added uh, difficulty of having to engage the audience. And so we really have to understand the culture uh, that the game is being translated to and try to communicate with the players and not break the experience by doing mistakes and things that don't match with the universe of the game. And uh, one example of something we can do is try to talk to the developers. Really. I I was playing the, the, the Beginner's Guide. I don't know if you know the game by David Redden. And uh, it's a wonderful game about making games. And, uh, mm -hmm. and a very short one. You can play like in one hour and a half in your computer, in Steam. And uh, the game is wonderful. And I wanted everybody to play it. So the first thing I did when I, I finished it was going to Steam and see what people were talking about it. And a lot of people were saying, I want to localize it. I'm starting a group, and you want to be there. I will localize it in like one month, two months. After three months, and because I followed the discussion, they gave up. <laughs> because it was a very complex thing. The dialogues were very deep and intricate, and the action was very much uh, uh, intertwined with the dialogue, the, the text. And so it was very important it, that it be translated correctly. And so I wrote to, to the author and uh, to the developer that made the game, and I told him this. I haven't got an, an answer yet, but I'm, I'm trying to do <laughs> something in the direction of making him understand that this kind yes. of thing we will not help him because I, actually he has sold like one million copies already so maybe he's not worried about what will come out of it but <laughs> if he really loves what he does I believe he wants people to have the same experience he had when developing it and other people that played in the original language had when playing it this is something i always think about when i see uh, for example, beautiful apps uh, that yeah. have horrendous app descriptions on iTunes or on Google Play and then horrendous localization because um, mm. there were some apps that I stopped using just because when I started using them, they were in English. So uh, it was okay for me. <laughs> but <laughs> then they localized them somehow and uh, obviously not using professional ser services. And then I just stopped using them because it was they were impossible to use. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and it's a shame. Yeah, sometimes it's a good mm -hmm. app that we end up. Not, 
And it, it's it's uh, very common, this kind of thing. Uh, they made a, a poll here in Brazil asking people if they preferred playing games in the original language or uh, translated ones. And 70% of the people, 70, it's not a, not a small number, preferred mm -hmm. translated games, uh, localized games, dub games that people could understand and play in their own language. Because it's one less thing to distract them from the action that is happening in front of them, so they can engage in a better way. But they want well localized. They want well localized games, for sure. Of course. We yeah. had some problems here very recently about a game that was very badly localized and uh, mm -hmm. ended up badly. <laughs> and so the <laughs> company gets a bad reputation because of that. That's yeah. right, yes. Because uh, uh, when a game is localized by uh, amateurs or crowdsourcing, uh, it's very hard to uh, guarantee high quality. You, ha you have to invest a lot of time and effort into editing the, the output of the crowd or free contributors and most of the time you you end up spending even more time on uh, editing and managing the translations exactly. of, uh, of volunteers so i think uh, going with the professional is probably a better idea in, ter in terms of uh, return on investment and how much how much how many time you spend on video game localization because it's great to have a great community who are passionate about your video game but uh, sometimes community can work and other times they can result into poorly translated uh, video games and uh, people yeah. simply gonna trash you on steam because you 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 localize the game and uh, they cannot understand a single thing, <laughs> or, yeah. it has a, oh, yeah, or it has a lot of mistakes or typos. People can be very brutal, especially gamers. <laughs> when, when gamers see something is up, <laughs> they call bullshit, <laughs> bullshit very easily. <laughs> yeah, and it's a hard crowd to please. It's a, it's hard to please them. Yeah. Yes, yeah. and because especially yeah, in, in, okay. in, in video game localization. Everyone seems to be a very good expert. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I mean, I mean, I mean gamers. <laughs> <laughs> Very true. <laughs> well, I so, think it's because people have some. Uh, they when when they see a, a game trailer or something like that, read about the game, they have some uh, uh, vision for what it should. Yes, expectations and vision what it should look like. And uh, when expectation meets reality, <laughs> then it can yeah. yeah, it can be tough. Not always a good surprise. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, uh, Yelena, do you want to take uh, another question? I think we have a, a couple we of have questions. We have two, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Can you read? Yeah. So Alex asks, uh, where can you look for jobs? I guess it's localization jobs. Mm -hmm. Well, what would uh, you say? Uh, mm. Sorry? I... Three top places, probably, just for to, just where to start, yeah? Mm -hmm. Well, you should be in the IGBA Facebook group, no doubt about that, because there you will know about the places uh, where maybe direct jobs can be posted, but uh, mostly uh, where developers meet and talk about what's happening in the industry, and then you know where to go. LinkedIn is another way, uh, another place where you can find uh, direct jobs or know about what uh, the studios are looking for or making. And uh, there was a very good post, I don't recall the name of the, po the, the writer now, that uh, was exactly about this, where, what, where you should look if you, were, uh, if you wanted to work in game organization. It was posted in uh, a personal blog, but uh, reposted in Facebook. And uh, I can bring the link to you later and post here. In yes. The it would be great if you could send me the links to everything to everything you were talking about today so that I could include it in uh, the show notes. Mm -hmm. Sorry? It would be great if you could send me the links to everything you mentioned to the Facebook oh. groups, to everything you mentioned today so that I could include it into the show notes. All right. I'll do that. Thank you. Uh, Yelena, do you want to take another question? Yep, uh, I think it's the last one, at the moment at least. Mm -hmm. uh, Tsuki asks, I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name, 
What do you think about people who accept non-professional translators and how it's a bit difficult to get a job at the beginning because someone, some people will do the work cheaper than you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's a hard one because we work in a largely unregulated market and uh, because we are freelancers, most of us are freelancers, we really work uh, for as much as we want or think is the best we can charge. Uh, many people suffer of the imposter syndrome, where, as the pe where the people think they are not good enough uh, to do mm. what they do. Sometimes they are very, very uh, capable of doing a good job, but they charge very little just because they don't understand the market. Uh, this is a problem that we have because of our universities mostly because uh, they don't prepare mm -hmm. people to be professionals that can fend for themselves and really put themselves out there and and so to work that out uh, i think the best thing is to be as i said to know about uh, how things work to be in touch with the market with your colleagues you learn a lot just by observing conversations on facebook i've uh, I, I think it's worth a uh, years of university studies sometimes considering yeah. the experience the things that people exchange there that help us understand what really goes on in the market there are many people that say that accuse others of charging very little but they charge as much as these people do because they need everybody, everybody goes through phases in their life where they just need to work like the beginning yeah. of their careers when they're just trying to find a place under the sun and uh, I've worked for uh, little pay already in my, my career because I didn't understand what was going on. And then I, when I learned how it really uh, worked, I started charging more and more. And that's how uh, things usually go. So I recommend that before you accept your first job, read everything you can about it. Talk to as many people you know. If you don't know, try to go after them. Participate in events uh, online also, but uh, especially where your presence uh, can show people that you exist and you can be trusted that you are a professional. This is important. Uh, the group that we have here, for example, in, in our city uh, has found many, many opportunities to work in all the areas and you need to because we got together and exchanged ideas and sometimes the someone was looking for someone else in another language or in another specialty and so things happen when we get together yeah and that's the i think the best you can do if you are starting yeah that's a, that's a wonderful advice i think uh, everybody every every freelancer goes through a stage where he's just starting out and uh, he's just he just it's, it's his first time experience with the market, right? So mm -hmm. you can't blame people for working for less, but you can at least try to educate people. For example, mm -hmm. we have many, many different kinds of uh, platforms like the open mic, for example, right now, yeah. or uh, uh, Facebook groups or LinkedIn groups. Uh, I think professional translators need to pay special attention to uh, young people in the translation industry and, and those who are starting out and show them uh, best practices and how to avoid common exactly. pitfalls okay. and uh, in order to do this we need to be more open and we need to create uh, platforms where yeah mm -hmm. ca and communities which brings yeah. us uh, <laughs> to our next to our second <laughs> topic yeah. which brings us to the second topic uh, uh shayla is uh, involved in uh working with local communities and one of your communities is actually gonna become a professional association right? is that correct Yes. Mm -hmm. Can you tell more about it? So this is a, a group that started meeting like almost three years ago when I moved city. I lived in another state, also in the south of Brazil. And I came to Curitiba to study. I have a son who was also uh, going to start university. And so I felt a bit alone and try to reach out to the people in uh, that I already knew here that knew other people and in the end I discovered that there was uh, an agency and uh, uh, we made a powwow there a powwow for people who don't know is an event that Pearl's platform uh, 
uh, offers as one of the activities the members can can hold. And so we organized the powwow there in this agency, and like 30 people came to the meeting, and everyone was so amazed at how many people they didn't know, and uh, that were translators and interpreters working in the same city they were, and it was a great meetup. And there, there were even people from other states that came to to see what it was about and great conversation. And uh, because we liked it so much, we started uh, meeting more often at mm, coffee shops, uh, bars, only party at first. And then there, there is a course here in Curitiba. It's an interpreter's course, a very uh, well known in Brazil by Versão Brasileira. And uh, it's, uh, they, they have many people that come from other places too. And because of these meetings, we started talking about having this, this group as a more professional uh, kind of, of group. And so one person there uh, said she had a school, a language school, and that she had space, a room there for us to meet. Mm -hmm. uh, in a monthly basis, and that's what we did. It was it was, we started like these official, more official meetings last year, and we made it in bar camp style. For people that don't know the idea of bar camps, they were they come from the informatics area, where it's a, like an event that people meet to have kind of an unconference thing, where people mm -hmm. talk to others, but it's not very formal. We decide mm -hmm. at the time what is going to be talked about. And it's very like horizontal uh, kind of event. And that's what we do here. Every meeting is like this. We decide in the beginning what we're going to talk about. Sometimes we have workshops, uh, talks about uh, specializations or things related to the market, like uh, price or how to establish your <coughs> as a professional, uh, officially, official professional, or anything that can be of interest for people that uh, meet, and anyone can participate. And now it's just uh, a group that gets together once a month and soon to be uh, an association, a regional association for our state. And uh, how, how, many, how many people do normally visit your events? Uh, all the meetings, uh, they, we usually have 20 plus people, like uh, any meeting, like we had in, in January. January here in Brazil is like a lost month, everybody says. Nobody does anything in January because everybody's on vacation and people go to the beach and this, this kind of thing. <laughs> we had like 25, 26 people in January and it was a very hot day and everybody was, oh my God, but everybody wanted to be there. And it, this is the spirit of the group, and very, uh, I'm very proud to be part of it because we we support each other. We not only give information, but everybody knows that they can feel safe there and talk about the things they go through and help each other mm -hmm. too in, in any sense that we can. And we are having a, a lot of projects going on as well, educational and professional development ones. Can you tell more about the projects you have? The projects? Yeah. So, uh, after the association is uh, finally founded, we are we have discussed and made uh, an ethics code, which we published in our site. And from the ethics code, we are going to uh, discuss the, the bylaws of the association which is something we got to the conclusion while discussing in our meetings that it was important to know where we come from and what we believe, what we hope, so as to decide what we wanted to do. But the idea is to get together uh, experienced people and students and teachers and anyone that is involved with the translation market, direct or indirectly, uh, we sometimes organize events like workshops. We we had one in the end of the year. We'll have another in April. Uh, we uh, organize uh, like uh, we get people together to travel to conferences that are in other cities. And sometimes people don't have enough money to go by themselves. But then we have already uh, rented a a whole hostel for sixteen 
translators to go to a conference in Rio de Janeiro. Uh, and we do things that uh, get people together around a common sense of trying to make the market more professional, educating mm -hmm. the beginners yeah. and making the, the experience people feel they are part of a larger body, too, which is very important for us to feel uh, valued because this is where we start. People say that we are not valued by others, but we have to start from ourselves yeah, to make this idea spread and even yeah. make contacts in the in the media and things like this to make us known the the question that i always ask when i give uh, talks in universities for example is if i ask uh, you now how many translators you know they usually say you <laughs> I don't know translator they know <laughs> and uh, yeah the, my dream is to have translators in movies and, and you know that people understand just as well what we do as what doctors and lawyers and engineers and whatever, because this is how we can be respected and better understood. And it, it will be easier to negotiate with clients. It will be easier to make people understand that what we do is, is important, necessary, and it's growing. The need for good translators is growing, has grown exponentially, at least for mm -hmm. Brazilian Portuguese. Uh, everybody I know is working a lot. So. Yeah. Yeah, I kind of have a feeling that uh, uh, demand for good translators has exceeded the supply. Do you think it's the same for your language pair? Has? I'm sorry, I didn't get the beginning. Uh, the demand for high quality translations has exceeded the supply. Mm -hmm. No doubt about that. <laughs> what we have is uh, a lot of people that uh, need good quality translations. They are starting to understand what uh, translation can do for you, for a product, for a company, for a project that you have. And so uh, when they they have already hired people that work in, uh, they say, are bilingual. And being bilingual is not nearly enough uh, preparation for you to be a translator or interpreter. And, uh, and so the, the reality is proving how much we need people that really understand the job, what, how it's done and how it should be done. And uh, that they understand the specialization they are working with. Sometimes we understand it better or in the same level of, as the professionals who work in the area. I don't develop games, but I understand more of the area than any uh, people that work by themselves because I have to understand all the areas, of course. Not saying that I, I know that much uh, more, but the idea is that I should go after this kind of thing to be a better professional. And so, yes, highly uh, high level translators are always in demand and it's growing beneath for them. Uh, do you think uh, uh, professional associations should uh, collaborate more with universities and, I don't know, create courses for uh, professional development and to talk more about marketing, business and specialization oh, yeah. before our students actually graduate? Because what I've noticed, uh, not only in my uh, language pair, but also in, in other countries, uh, mm -hmm. they teach how to be a good translator but they mm -hmm. don't teach how to be a good entrepreneur or how to be a yes. good businessman or how to be a good at marketing or how to specialize. And they, they don't even talk about the importance of specialization because that's, in my humble opinion, that's, uh, that every single translator should have a, a narrow field rather than be a, a generalist. Yes. Yes. I think professional associations should be more involved in the life of uh, universities and create programs or other opportunities for students, for future translators to learn more about our profession? Yeah, no doubt about that. Just today I was talking with our IGDA group about the need uh, for us to go after people and not wait for them to go after us and not be just the reference that is known for uh, being uh, like a very, a lot of experts that just avail their knowledge. It's not like that. We should be working along with teachers in universities. In, we have here in Brazil some, like what we call free courses that they are not free, they are paid, but free in the sense that they are not regulated by the same uh, uh, 
agencies as the universities, for example. And sometimes they they don't pay attention to this. And universities are a bigger problem because mostly they prepare translators to be academic people and not entrepreneurs. And uh, many good translators get lost in this and end up giving up translating because they can't find themselves in the market. Uh, they, they feel explored and many times they are when they work with agencies that don't consider uh, translators more than just service providers like any other kind, like the one that you buy food from and not trying to compare, but the idea is that you don't see how much work we have to put into being good translators. And this should be valued. And the people that understand this, they will give us the space that we, we need. And uh, if we don't understand the market, we can't talk to these people in the same level. And we can't make our niche uh, the same idea that Unity was uh, defending, that we should work in very, uh, I, I have this idea too that we should work in situations that we understand every day better and so we are renowned by being the, the one expert in, in that specialization or that area or that kind of game or uh, what you choose to, to follow because you have affinity with it, because you, you find it every day easier to work with it and so you can dedicate time to getting your work in, with a better quality every time and uh, this is uh, something that we are trying to work towards uh, changing with the work of our group that is turning into the association uh, getting to the market idea of uh, preparing before you leave university to be there as a professional as a company of one person really and not uh, somebody who will suffer from what whatever the market throws at you and doesn't have to be that way if you understand how things work. And uh, you can build a very nice space for you if you do things well, if you communicate, if you participate in, as I said, and I will always reinforce this, participate in groups and communicate with people and try to uh bring along the beginners and not mm -hmm. only talk badly about them because i don't know where to be yeah everybody was a beginner one day and uh, we have uh, to start somewhere how can we encourage uh, students to be more involved in the life of the translation community because students mm -hmm. uh, may think that they, they are not part of the translation community, but they actually are because they are in the process mm -hmm. of studying translation. So uh, how do you think uh, we can encourage them to be more active or join professional associations or to self-educate themselves about all, all kinds of stuff? How can mm -hmm. we improve that? Well, one thing that we are trying to do here is to be present in the, the university courses and talk to the students in whatever opportunity we, we can. Uh, we have many teachers in our group that work in such universities. And so we go to the, we go in the class really and talk to the students about how translation works. And mm -hmm. this is something that for them is very enlightening because they only see translators first as translators of books. There are no other kinds of translators. If it's not a book translator, and that's the, the word really, book translator, it's Google translator. And, uh, so, yeah, we really have to, to shed light in how big this universe is. And when they get the idea and they see it as a valid option, uh, as a profession, and something that really can support your your household and very well, at that, uh, they start seeing possibilities for them to and want to participate. But uh, also something that is very important that uh, not many people, uh, I think they don't give the, the, the due credit is that you have to understand what you want first and not go after what everybody else says you should go. Mm -hmm. Because we have this idea of getting a salary and getting uh, something that we will support you in very well, but at the same time, uh, you don't understand that freelance work is different from working for somebody else and that you make all the decisions and what you get 
is what you put value into and how much this value is is really up to you you have to understand what you do and how much time it takes how much you value your life and the time that you dedicate to your work and so that's how it's uh, how you form the price that you are going to charge and how much you're going to and so you'll be a, a professional that won't just think about money you can think about everything else and be a well-rounded professional yeah i absolutely agree with you uh yelena can you take another question please uh, yes sure. we have first of all we have a comment from tiago it's not a question just a comment uh the, the translators back camp that Sheila mentioned uh mm -hmm. they are awesome <laughs> he attended mm -hmm. them and they're a turning point in people's career thank you Sheila, for the millionth time <laughs> <laughs> thank you <Thiago. laughs> so and we have another question from uh tsuki Sheila, uh will you participate at an event at the federal university or uberlandia called entrad this year did you hear about it I heard about it. I was checking it out. I would like to be there, but I'm not sure yet. But uh, I, I have my, my eyes on it yet. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, Shayla, thank you so much for the very interesting conversation. Uh, we've been talking for about an hour already, so uh, I think it's, uh, yeah, time flies, time flies very fast. Yeah. On these, these labs are amazing. Just, it's like a time machine. So. Uh, I think we're gonna wrap things up. Uh, we probably have another five, 10 minutes. If someone has questions, please ask them in the comment box below. Or if someone wants to call in, probably. Yeah, if you guys wanna call in, you can call us and we can chat. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Shayla. This was very, uh, very insightful and uh, you shared a lot of valuable information especially for those people who are interested in game localization as as much as we do mm -hmm. uh, i hope Yelena enjoyed it <laughs> I <did. laughs> yeah. even for those I people think, who are I not think that game localization is uh, on the one hand of course it's uh, something different from translation on the other hand there are a lot of things in common so yeah sure i enjoyed yeah. <laughs> for sure <laughs> Thank you very much for the opportunity. It was really fun being here, and uh, I hope I, I contributed in some way. And I want to congratulate you on this great initiative, and I hope it goes on and on. We have someone calling in. Uh, seems like it's spam. And, okay. <laughs> and we have also a question from uh, Natalia Nichayo. She asks, uh, so some students of our university write their their graduation thesis about localization. Are they welcome to contact you, Shayla? For sure. You please can contact me, and I will leave the all the links and my contact information. With contact. Yeah. Elena. I will publish it. Yes, I will publish it. Uh, we'll publish it in our recap of this blab. I don't know tomorrow or on Friday at the latest and I'll also send uh, the link to this post to all our subscribers and we'll share it on social media so I'm sure you won't miss it. Great, thank you very much. Love being here. All right, uh, do you guys have any other questions at all? Yes. <laughs> we still have a couple more minutes. <laughs> Uh, if you enjoyed this blab, feel free to share uh, your thoughts on Twitter. Use hashtag blab in translators. And if you're not subscribed to our mailing list, please check out our website at blabintranslators.com and subscribe. That way you'll never miss another episode. And we'll send you some uh, friendly reminders about our upcoming blabs and uh, our topics. Uh, I guess we're going to wrap Run things up. up. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching. Uh, it was a, a real pleasure having you here tonight, Shale. And thank you for thank joining you, us. Thank you, Elena, okay. for help, helping us uh, with uh, our blab. And thank you, everyone, for watching. You guys are the best. Uh, uh, well, I guess that's it. Have a good day, everyone. <laughs> and we'll see you next week. See you on Wednesday. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>